secret so powerful that if revealed, it would devastate the very foundations of Christianity. It was a huge relief that Da Vinci Code was as successful as it was. Adapting it was daunting because the story meant so much to different people for different reasons. There's something so unique about what Dan Brown has created here in this Robert Langdon character that is incredibly original, thought-provoking, and on a filmic level, irresistible. So when I had the opportunity to go on with the Robert Langdon character, I couldn't imagine not going further with it. Ron, Tom, and I were interested and challenged by turning Angels and Demons into the sequel because we knew that in the Da Vinci Code, Langdon, a great character, was somewhat static. And in this movie, there's lots of action, and he drives the story of this movie. This is the first marker. The path is alive. I've never made a sequel before as a director. Never wanted to because I'm always interested in trying to explore new territory creatively. But with Angels and Demons, in an odd way, I felt it wasn't a sequel. It is exercising a whole other set of cinematic muscles for me as a director. One day, the Templars simply stopped searching. They quit the Holy Land and traveled directly to Rome. Da Vinci Code existed, a lot of it in the past. And even the storyline that was occurring in the moment was sort of existed in its own timeless bubble. I need a map showing all the churches of Rome. Angels and Demons is just flat out different. It demands another rhythm, another tempo, another kind of drive. It's a very modern story. It literally is a ticking bomb thriller. And it's couched in this completely original mystery. Oh my God. I think all those people who love to read and like to go to the movies understand that it's a real challenge to take a great, exciting book and make it into a movie that really works and fulfills the potential of the story for film audiences. Angels and Demons is, is certainly not exempt from that challenge. Akiva Goldsman and David Cap are two writers who have a great deal of experience taking challenging but exciting novels and making them into really compelling movies. It was great to reconnect with Akiva Goldsman, and, and we had begun talking about the possibility of Angels and Demons while we were doing Da Vinci Code. The dust settled, audiences all around the world had really enjoyed the movie, and, uh, and we started talking about doing Angels and Demons. This has a lot more motion, a lot more dynamism, a lot more action, a lot more murder so it's more easily adaptable. In 14 minutes, he's gonna be dead. At a certain point, due to the writer's strike and the fact that Akiva is not only a top screenwriter, but he's also an A-plus movie producer, uh, uh, he ceased to be available, and we had the great good fortune of getting David Kep, who I had worked with on the paper, and he came in and just continued to do great work. I had a lot of fun writing the Robert Langdon character and finished off the shooting script. The things that they'd established for the characters, I needed to be mindful of and, and, and respect, primarily Langdon, since he's the only one who, who recurs. But in terms of style, I think there are certain stylistic things that carry over, but it's a whole new movie and it can be approached in a whole new way. Your expertise, your recent involvement with certain church, shall we say, mysteries? This is the first book in the Robert Langdon series. Dan Brown was really onto something when he wrote this for the first time. Now, it was a long time ago. He wrote it before there was Google or internet. He was definitely onto this concept that very smart people in the 1600s were entertaining themselves in this art that they were creating. Angels and Demons actually all started in Il Passetto, just outside Vatican City. My wife and I were having a tour, and a scholar told us that this tunnel was used as an escape route for the popes in case they were attacked and began talking about the enemies of the Pope, certainly the followers of Galileo, who were not too happy that Galileo was under house arrest. He started to have images of cloaked scientists running around in tunnels, and the, the image was just too exciting to leave out. I had to write the book. The great thing about the book is, and all Dan's books, is that they are loaded with historical detail and an intense amount of research. It's really a gift. I mean, you just get to flip through and find out things you never knew. I think that's part of what people go to these movies for and, and what they buy Dan's books for. 
is that level of scholarship. Galileo's third text. For Angels and Demons, I did the bulk of the research before I wrote the novel. I made three trips to Italy. I uh, spent a lot of time in Rome and Vatican City, gathering information on churches and artwork and Vatican history. Well, Dan Brown, who is also an executive producer on the film, you know, he's a remarkable intellect. He's created these novels which are completely unique, wildly entertaining, and very thought-provoking. And yet he's, he's very humble about it, and I find a great asset to the filmmaking side of the process. Any time that you adapt a book into a movie, there are going to be all kinds of changes. Uh, I happen to think that these filmmakers have made great changes, and yet the heart of this book remains the same. We will destroy your form illness. We will brand your epiphany. Wait, stop it, stop it. Brand them. The trick with adaptation is always just how faithful you are to the source material. I mean, when we started developing, we were looking and saying, what translates? What feels filmic? What feels like it will evoke the spirit of the book without necessarily the literal retelling of scene for scene? Another Illuminati legend says that there are a set of five brands. When Dan wrote the book, the clue path was different. There's a set of brands that move the narrative. I said, we need to make up another clue that unifies the two paths between the bomb plot and the murder plot. They're sort of parallel tracks. And in a movie, you want more convergence. So I was trying to figure out a way of converging the two. We couldn't figure out an interesting Langdon-esque, Dan Brown-like way to do it. I called up Dan. He was researching his next book. I can't say where, because it's all top secret, but he was getting this, this private tour perched up in this out of the way place, very exotic. And he said, but I have two or three minutes. And literally while he was waiting for his tour to begin, he invented this really ingenious new way for Langdon to discover a clue that was crucial in discovering the path of illumination. There's a fifth brand. It's not an anagram, it's just two cross keys. Ron called and said, we need to find some way to point the hero to St. Peter's tomb, where the antimatter is hidden. And we thought about it and came up with the idea of using the crossed keys, only we turn them upside down. And the reason that points to St. Peter's tomb is that St. Peter was actually crucified upside down. I, I couldn't believe it, it was jaw dropping. Immediately we just built it into the script and there it is in the movie. The fact that we use them as a clue, it's a nice little piece of storytelling again and that all flows from symbology, which is the heart of the Langdon experience. So Dan is a remarkable creative uh, force and it's really fun to have him as a resource. Crossed keys, but those are upside down. St. Peter. I love that we're sort of like making a trip through the Renaissance in all of these films. We had Da Vinci, of course, in the first one, and now we have Galileo, and we're really getting into the, the great path towards enlightenment and understanding and a questioning of our universe that goes much beyond the norms of obeying, you know, a church dogma. By and large, it's all just one fabulous game of trivial pursuit, but it's for important matters that they're pursuing. The whole thing takes place over 12 hours or less, um, counting travel time. That includes a flight to Europe. So pace was essential. You, you have to keep in mind all, at all times that somebody's going to be killed every hour, you know? But I found that to be an advantage because they couldn't sit and talk about those things. They had to sort of shout it at each other in a speeding car or while they were running to the next location. And that actually makes for a much more exciting movie, I think. The dub. This movie is much more visceral. You could sort of say, hey, just in case you think we talked a lot that last time, this time we'll run. Hey! I think what's great about the stories that Dan Brown creates is that they stimulate so much curiosity, discussion, and research. Everybody that I know gets involved with the project, working on it, having read the book, seeing our movie now, it drives them to the library. It sends them to the internet. They, they want to explore the Illuminati. They want to understand Bernini, Galileo, their relationships with the Vatican. The mystery of the Illuminati goes on and on and on. And there's so much written about it. Some believe, some don't. Church of Illumination is somewhere. It's fascinating stuff. And it's the kind of thing that in the rich mind of Dan Brown, it leads to a fascinating set of clues and a great mystery.